Hello, this is David Scott Peters with TheRestaurantExpert.com, and I'm absolutely thrilled you're here to watch this month's episode of the Smart Systems Insider version 2.0, a video magazine created for you, the independent operator, to not only survive, but thrive in the sea chain restaurants out there. Make more money, get your life back, have managers know their job. Now, in this month's episode, I'm very excited to be talking with Jason Motika, one of our elite members, who he and his partner, David, have five concepts in Alaska. And he's gonna talk a little bit about their journey, but more importantly, the importance of running your business by the numbers. Now, I'm gonna follow that with a Smart Systems Pro uh, tip, and that is me walking through the software and showing you the most important tool we have in the whole system called the Budget Variance Report. Followed up by an interview with one of our coaches here at therestaurantexpert.com, Brittany Tai. Now, Brittany's not just any coach. She runs all of our live trainings here. She works hand in hand with our consulting team, and she knows these systems inside and out. She's gonna share with you the step-by-step -step how to get that budget variance report put together and what some of those challenges are to get that done. Now, be sure to stay and watch till the very end, because I've got an exciting interview with one of my good friends, Cameron Carrington, one of the, the founder and principal of Repeat Returns, a restaurant loyalty program, and he is by, by far the primary, the one person I ever listened to when it comes to what? restaurant marketing, he's the authority. And in this interview, he's gonna share with you the ins and outs of Yelp, the importance of it. I know what you thought, oh, love-hate relationship. Well, he's gonna tell you how to maximize the results with Yelp and why it's so damn important. Now, stay with me in about two seconds. I'm gonna share with you your responsibility to running profitably and why budgets are so important. Look, if you wanna run a profitable restaurant, it's not I hope, I pray, I, I wish, right? My social working friends, think about it. I call you a social worker because why? We're in what industry? We're in the hospitality business, right? We're born to take care of people. We create memories. So it comes down to everything, the whole experience, the outside of your building to walking in the door, what flooring you've chosen, what you've put on your walls, what kind of seating you have. Is there a bar? Is it a small? Is it a large dominant structure? You know, uh, are you quick service? Are you full service? Are you fine dining? Are you, what kind of colors have you chosen? The uniforms, right? The style of service, the product quality, the menus, the design, everything goes into creating a wonderful memory. See, great hospitality isn't wow customer service. No, get me wrong, I want wow customer service. It's truly making sure your guests' needs are anticipated and met for them. They're not looking around when a steak's delivered and go, oh, where's a steak knife? Hold on one second. Hey, I need a steak knife. It's when two people come in, a group of people come in, and they can engage with each other. And they're, they want for nothing. It's not, can I look around? Could somebody refill my drink? It's just automatically refilled. That they can pay attention to each other. And by doing so, they walk out of your restaurant and go, man, that was an awesome experience. Wasn't this place great? So know that we were built to take care of people. Hell, we're built, built to take care of people. We care about our employees. We're not a typical chain restaurant. We're an independent. We care that Sally's pregnant. We care that Jose has already been working two jobs, just knuckles bare, and we want to find some way to keep them here at our restaurant. How can we pay them? and not have to work that second job. We care that somebody needs time off. We care, we care, we care. Often we care to a fault. We forget about ourselves. We forget about the owners. We forget about families and investors. We forget about everybody, not just the individual employee, but all the employees. We forget about our customers. So how do you change your mindset to be able to run profitably? And that's this. You've got to understand you have a responsibility to run a profitable restaurant. It's not, again, like I said, I hope, I wish, I pray, my social working friends. You have to plan to run profitably because I want you to think about this. Number one, you need to run profitably for your guests, your customers. They walk in your do door because you fulfill a need in the community, don't you? Like if you're a barbecue restaurant, they want barbecue, they're coming to your place, right? If you're a steakhouse, they need a steak, they're coming to you. If you're a breakfast place, doesn't matter what you are, you fulfill a need in the community. They want you. That's the reason why they walk in your door, right? You have a responsibility to who? To your employees. That's how they're gainfully employed. They feed their families. They pay their bills. Uh, right? They take care of themselves. Granted, half of them drink their paychecks away. Whole nother story. 
But the fact of the matter is you have a responsibility to run profitably to them. But here's where we as independent operators screw it up all the time. You have a responsibility to you, your family, and any investors you may have. And I'm here to say you come first, not last, my social working friends. First. Because I want you to think about this. If your restaurant closes because you don't run profitably, there is no restaurant for your guests. You're gone. You're out of the community. You're not giving them what they need. If you close your business because you're not running profitably, there are no jobs. I don't care if you're a small restaurant that have eight employees, you're a large restaurant with 200. Most of us have 40, 50, 60 employees. Imagine they're out on the street, right? You didn't do your job, you didn't run profitably. But here again is where we screwed up. What about you, your family, and any investors you may have? See, I'm here to say you come first, not last, because here's the deal. If you take care of you first, you make sure you make money, your family's taken care of, your investors are happy, then there are jobs for your employees and there is a restaurant for your guests year after year after year after year. See, by changing the mindset that we are built for hospitality, take care of others, but when it comes to financial, the financials of your business, you gotta take care of you first. This is what happens. See, instead of getting your profit and loss statement and, and saying, oh my gosh, why is my labor so high? And you go, oh, I remember I, I gave Jose overtime because I don't want him working another job. I love him to death. I want him to be a part of my team the whole time. Well, you start making those kind of decisions and you look at it and you go, oh, I don't, gee, I don't get it why I'm not making money. See, if you have a budget and you've got your P&L, you will set a target. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. But here's the deal. If you are making the money you deserve, and you decide to give Jose over time because you've decided to do that, it's not that anybody's robbing you of profitability, you've made a decision what to do with your money, and I'm all for it. See, you decide what your profitability is supposed to be. You make sure people follow those numbers. So that comes into the next piece, and that is we've gotta have a budget. See, if you wanna have any chance to make it in this business, you've got to do what the chains do well. That is put systems in place, impose your will, have targets, run your business based off a system, not just your gut. Don't get me wrong. I believe that your gut, your experience, that's important. But the fact of the matter is we need targets to shoot for. We need to have systems in place. I want you to think about this. My son, when he was in high school, worked for a company called Yum Brands. Many of you may have heard of them. They're like the largest, one of the largest nations, uh, nation's largest franchisees of like Taco Bell and, and other uh, restaurants from there. So like KFCs and so on. And he was working on the line as a cook. And we were talking about it. And he told me they had 14,000 restaurants. Yum Brands at the time had 14,000 restaurants all over the world. Now think about it. How the hell do they have 14,000 restaurants and you have a chance running them with no owners in them, but you, you get out of your business and go, oh my gosh, I've left for five minutes and my phone's going off. Where's the plunger? Idiot. That, right? We create these problems for ourselves by not having systems in place, by not giving the expectations to our management team and our employees of what we want done, how well we want it done, by when. So we've got to duplicate what the chains do. That's what we do here at therestaurantexpert.com. We give you the same systems, tools, and chains use without losing your independence. We love our guests, we love our employees, but you are gonna do what? You're gonna make money. There's nothing wrong with that. Remember, we're changing our mindset. We can be social workers as far as taking care of our guests and hospitality, right? In our brain, take care of people, but we've got to add ourselves that list, take care of ourselves, and it starts with a budget. Now, why are budgets so important and how do we create them? First of all, let's back up a second. Let's say I've got a P&L in my hand. What is, when you get your P&L, when do you get it? 15 days in the next period? 30 days, 60, 90, I've seen worse. David, I can't get my bookkeeper to give me my numbers. Are you freaking kidding me? Who pays them? Well, I get this P&L, let's call it 15 days in the next period. And what do you do? You search, 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 go to the last page, look at the bottom, go, crap. Right? You didn't make the money you were supposed to. Whether you lost money, made money, you didn't make the money you were supposed to, you're unhappy, you throw it on the desk, it's over. Many of you can't even read the damn chart of accounts. It means nothing. If I ask you what's in number, what that number is, you go, I don't know, I gotta call my bookkeeper, I gotta call my accountant. That's not good. Your P&L is your report card. How did you do? Well, I've got this P&L, right? We look at it, we go, oh, I didn't make the money I deserved. Well, what we do here at therestaurantexpert.com 
is we ask you for your trailing 12 months profit and loss statements. And we're going to figure out what your sales were for each month. We know what your sales mix is on each month, 80% food sales, 10% bottled beer, and so on. We know your cost of goods sold for the last year ran 38%. And we know poor cost ran for bottled beer 28% and 22% for draft beer and 34% for wine and so on. Then we look at your labor and we say, oh, the fixed expenses. Management salaries are running uh, $15,000 a month and my cooks have been running 13% uh, percent each month. My servers about 2.5%, my bar 1.5% and so on. So variable expenses versus fixed expenses. Then we go line by line by line down your whole profit and loss statement, and we find that rent is $10,000 a month fixed, but our paper supplies are running about 2.25% variable. And so what we do is we build each month based off those fixed and variable expenses. We know the sales coming across, and we can build a template for your budget that says if you operate the business the same way you did the last 12 months, here's what you're going to make or lose in the next 12 months. See, I don't care about fiscal year. I care about the next 12 months. That's what I can control. So you don't wait till the, well, oh my gosh, you got to wait till January to write a budget. No, write it now, right? So here's the deal. We create this template. Now here's what's wonderful about it. A profit and loss statement is the past. You can't change the past. And if I try and run my business with a profit and loss statement, it's like driving a sports car at 75 miles an hour with your front windshield blacked out and only using your rear view mirror. That's what your profit and loss statement is. You will crash. See, what a budget is, is ripping off that film that I can see out the front windshield. I need the rear view mirror to know where I've been, but I gotta know where I'm going. So what we do is we look at it this way. Say, okay, let's say you're brand new with us. First thing we do, we get on a budget call. So we create the template for you based on your numbers. We get on the phone with you. And if you're on the phone with me, one of the first things I say, hey, uh, do you have a Keanu Report way sheet and a purchase allotment system in place? You're probably gonna say no. Two clipboard systems and a budgeting system that I usually guarantee people two to three points reduction in their food cost overnight without inventories, without recipe cards, without all these things. So we're starting at a 38% food cost. That's what we ran last year. I say, okay, month one, we're gonna train your management team on the key item port waste sheet, two clipboard systems, and the purchase allotment system. We're gonna train them on it. On month two, we're going to hold them accountable to those three systems. And we're gonna take your 38% food cost, reduce it to 35%. See, now we put a, trained a system, now we're gonna hold them accountable. We can't hold people accountable to results if you've not trained them on a system, so I train them. Now, I know for a fact I've got to still reduce my food costs way under 35%. So what do I do? I say, hey, we're going to start shelf to sheet inventory. It's going to take you 20, 30 man hours. We'll help you with it. Uh, how, how soon can you have that done so we can start measuring? Well, we'll start in month one. We think we can have it done in two months. Well, month three, we'll say we're going to start taking inventories, which we can start to measure. That which we measure improves. But in the meantime, how about recipe cost cards? There's 40 to 60 man hours of work. Most important things in your business are budgets and recipe costing cards. By the way, what are the two things most restaurants never have? Budgets and recipe costing cards. So we're going to put these recipe cards in place. We've got, to, we've got to start them. We start with batch recipes. Well, we did that because we're working on budgets. We can now have our item recipes, those things that we sell, right? Chicken wings. Oh. Wait a second, oh, by the way, just think about it. You've got five sauces, make your own ranch dressing, you still uh, prep your own carrots and celery, and wings are sold to you by the pound, you sell them by the each. By the way, there's nine batch recipes that you have to do, not only to count accurate inventory, but before you ever do an item recipe, put 12 chicken wings on a plate. So I have all my recipes done now. Well, what did it take you? Uh, see, I say, how long do you think it'll take you, I should say, oh, it'll take me four months. I'd love to push you, but if four months is what you think it is, we started in month one, we start on those recipe cards, we move forward. By the end of month four, we're done. That's our verbal contract. Month five, we're going to do what we call a menu profit generator analysis, where we look at your sales mix based on what your customers actually ordered, your current accurate up-to-date recipe costing cards. We'll know exactly what your food cost should be if there was no waste, no theft, no spoilage, perfect restaurant, which does not exist but we'll know what your menu should produce. So let's say, for instance, it's producing a 32% food cost. Now you're running 35, you used to be running 38. We know we've got room, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a menu engineering process. And the first time through, 
If you've ever done it with recipe cost cards and the science behind it with me, I can save you three to seven points the first time and only the first time. I can't save you three, seven points every time we engineer your menu, why? Then I'd be like a credit card processor who calls you every day and says, hey, if you switch to me, I'll save you money. Well, at this point in time, somebody should be paying me for as many companies that have called me and said they can save me money, right? So you get it once. So if we know in month five, we're gonna re-engineer the menu, we wanna find a five point drop in food cost, take us from a 32% ideal food cost down to a, um, a th uh, what you call it, 30, a 27% ideal food cost. I had to do the math in my head, right? So we re-engineer it, you gotta design it. We say by month six, you're gonna put the new menu out at a target of 27% ideal food cost, right? And then, oh, by the way, I'm going to, since we're going to be putting all these other systems in place to control the kitchen, I'll give you a gold star if you can hit one and a half to two points higher than ideal food cost. So now our new target is 29%. So in month six, we take it from 35% to 29%. Because what did I find? I found that not only could I reduce my food cost by re-engineering the menu, but I still had all these gaps. And during that time, because we took inventories and put our invoices in, we can now start to look, and we have recipe costing cards, we can run a usage report and say, I used 20 pounds more brisket than I should have. So your kitchen manager or chef has a true roadmap of what to fix, how to achieve this number. We don't just snap our fingers and reduce our food cost. We do this for each item, and then we take it 29% for the rest of the year. We do this for every cost of goods sold a, a level or line item, I should say, every labor example, whether it's whether it's a fixed cost and we're gonna increase salaries by adding managers or giving raises, whether we're gonna trim labor from our kitchen from 13% to 10% and so on. You create a plan, your plan for success. And ultimately when we're done, you get to the bottom line at the, for that year and you say, ah, that's what I deserve. Now you have a proactive plan to put in place with your management team to achieve profitability. See, instead of being a reactive management team, getting the P&L going, oh crap, we're a proactive management team because this is what we want to shoot for. Now, imagine when you get that profit and loss statement, we put it up against the budget and we see that where we hit or missed. If you missed a number, what system did I put in place that the managers aren't using? What, what if they were using it? What system did I put in place? They're using it, holy crap, I still didn't hit my number. What new system do I put in place to change my reality? Now, whether I had managers use the system and I've got to retrain them, get them back in. Whether I want to put a new system in place because they were following it, I missed my numbers. I go to the bottom of that month, that period, if you will, you could be on 13 period accounting, see that I should have made $7,000 more than I did that month, that period, I should say. I, I didn't make it. I still may have made money, but $7,000 is on the table. It's gone. So instead of accepting it, oh, crap. What small changes can I make over the next 11 months, the next 10 months, the next eight months, wherever you are in your fiscal year or not fiscal, your budget year, I should say. What changes can I make without giving up guest satisfaction, without cutting product quality, without screwing my guest and staying true to my core values to make that $7,000 back, proactively manage, proactively create new targets. See, I don't know how you think you can be successful in the restaurant business without a budget. I don't know how you can think you're going to be successful in the restaurant business without understanding you've got to make money. It's not just about making pretty food taste good and have a great experience. It's really important, but so isn't keeping your doors open and taking care of your guests, taking care of your employees, you and your family. So understand from this point forward, you have a responsibility to run profitably. It's not a hope. It's not a prayer. It is reality. And the best way to do that is to use a budget. And if you're a member, make sure you call us today, talk to one of your, co your coach you're working with and say, hey, I'm ready to get my budget together. We'll ask you for the right information. We'll create the template. We'll do the budget with you. If you're not a member and you want to learn more, make sure you give us a call toll free at 1-877-457-6278. Dial extension 106 and ask for Greg Sauerbach, our solutions coach. And if you'll take time, to tell us about you, learn about what we do, mention you watch this video magazine regarding your responsibility to run profitably. If at the end of the call, what we do is not right for you, we will give you a free installation of our online Budget Creator Pro software so you can have that same power that our members do.
that. I'm here with Jason Motika, one of our elite members. Uh, they've got he and his partner have multiple businesses up in Alaska. Do me but number one, I want to thank you for being here with me today and sharing. Um, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, your journey, and your restaurants. Yeah, so uh, my name is Jason Matika, and we uh, started our business in 2005, myself uh, and my partner, David McCarthy, up in Denali National Park, which is one of the most remote spots in Alaska. It's actually, if you make Alaska like this, it's right in the middle. It's uh, one of the uh, most heavily traveled areas in Alaska, and we started <clears throat> with the first restaurant called the Denali Park Salmon Bake, small restaurant. We thought we were going to have 15 employees. Uh, the next uh, two weeks, we ended up hiring 60. And we grew that company in 2005 to uh, opening a second rec restaurant in 2010, the uh, Prospector's Historic Pizzeria and Ale House. Uh, that same year, uh, 12 miles down the road, we opened uh, 49 State Brewing Company, an old three bay bus barn in the middle of Alaska and started brewing beer. Then in 2012, we purchased a 40 cabin hotel <clears throat> overlooking the national park and opened a fine dining restaurant called The Overlook. And then in 2016, we purchased a facility in Anchorage, Alaska and opened a second 49th State Brewing Company location and is one of the largest volume restaurants in Alaska today. So, I mean, this just goes from a little idea to a big company. So talk a little bit about, um, you've been working, we've been working together for about a year now, yeah. I guess. Uh, talk about your journey. What, what, what was the beginning like? Why did you want to find a system? I mean, you, you're a numbers guy. You already had spreadsheets, all this. Share a little bit about that. It was interesting as any business as you grow and, and myself I do handle the business up uh, the business side of things and the finances and then my partner David McCarthy he handles the operation and the food quality and the brewing the beer and so it's a very interesting dynamic as being a business owner saying hey you know you're in charge of the operations and you're in charge of the numbers right. and so when we were growing the biggest challenge we had was, was like how are you actually plan and run this business by the numbers. We knew we had to run the business by the numbers, right. but we were always like, how, you know, how are we going to go ahead and do that? And when we started out, we had just spreadsheet after spreadsheet. And David's like, you got to give me some budget, you know, some, some labor budgets for these employees. I'm like, David, we got, we got six companies, like 450 employees, and we created the spreadsheet, 27 pages long. It took an hour and a half just to enter the names into it. And we realized very quickly that there was no way for us to go ahead and run the businesses that we operated that were seasonal at the time when we started and being able to go ahead and plan and forecast this out and actually run the business by the numbers. So you uh, you were looking for a system. Uh, what was that journey like? So so I know we met each other because you came to a seminar. Uh, this business partner I think saw me on YouTube, yeah. saw me speak at a show yeah. and said you're going because you need this stuff and you came back and said no no you need to get here we've got to go together. What is it about uh, why did Smart Systems Pro make sense to you? Because again, you're a numbers person. What was that change? Well, we when we opened our location in Anchorage, it was a very high volume location, and we knew very quickly that you know a lot of money would come, was coming in, but money was going out just as fast. And we realized after the first summer that we weren't going to be able to sustain this this new venture we had, and you know all the other businesses on top of the whole house of cards had come tumbling down if we didn't find a solution fast. And David was in uh, Las Vegas at the uh, bar uh, bar pizza expo. Uh, and, Michael and Barr, MP2, yeah. so same week. Yeah. And, and seen you, and he'd seen you for a couple years. And he's right. like, this guy's pretty funny, you know, like right. tells some pretty good jokes. And, <laughs> and so, so he, good qualification. He had seen your presentation there, and he he called me on the phone. He's like, hey, he sent me a text. So you should go to this this seminar, this nuts uh, soups and nuts uh, yeah. workshop. And so. Um, I basically, you know, up in Alaska, and it was April, right before a season started. So you know what? If there's going to be a time that we can try and get this, you know, this train back on tracks, now's the time. And so flew down there um, with one of our accounting managers, and we sat through the three day course. And I was listening and watching these systems, and I was like, this makes sense to me. This is something that I can implement that's cloud based that we can build on to go ahead and help get our company back on track and actually see what our numbers are doing on a weekly basis. And before that, you know, as a business owner, you're entering your QuickBooks, you're reconciling your bank accounts, and you're like, okay, there's money in the bank account, but you don't have any way to gauge how efficiently your manager's are running the business. Because when you're a business owner, the goal is that your managers run the business for you. Well, the challenge for any business owner is, well, how do you get them to do that? And how do you hold them accountable to go ahead and uh, you know run your business properly so you can actually sit back and say, okay, how do I want to steer this company? How do I want to grow this company, right? Because that's what business owners want to do. They want to grow companies and build things and be creative. But the reality of situations when you look into the bank accounts, and you're like, okay, well, I can't do this or I can't do that. 
And so most people are trying to find out, well, how much can I spend? Or how, how, is it gonna, how much is it, time is it gonna take me to get to this point? And that's what the system helped us create. So what was your first uh, either aha or big change that you found when you started going in and putting these systems in place? Because it's a culture change. It's tough on management. They, they want to fight, tell you why it won't work, or we, we don't need this or whatever. What was that big change for you? What was the one or two things that you came up with? Well, to me, uh, you know, the prime cost, our prime cost, our first, you know, uh, year in business was like 70%. You know what I mean? And we're doing huge numbers, but we're not making hardly any money. The, we're spending the money on the labor and the food costs. They're throwing things away and they're just not, you know, they have massive amounts of inventory. I mean, truckloads of food coming in for these busy tourist season and they're sitting in the warehouse and they're, they, they're, they're, they're can't, they can't count it. There's stuff just being misplaced and going bad. And, and there's a lot of organizational changes because of the fact that we could actually take an inventory, right? Taking an inventory for, for a 30,000 square foot facility across six companies and trying to go ahead and get them to count the inventory. Accurately, like, on time. Every Sunday. Right. And they're like, what are you trying to do? Our <laughs> managers are like, what are you guys like? Oh, Jason came back. <laughs> Jason came back from this seminar and David and Jason went and they're thinking this is all gonna change. And it was like pulling teeth. It was absolutely a, a growing process. And to be honest, like it still is today, but they start to see the changes, you know what I mean? And they start to see the improvements. They start to see the bonus paychecks and they're like, okay, well this system actually isn't so bad because now my life is improving because, okay, counting the inventory every Sunday doesn't seem like a bad thing because you, guess what? I got a new house, I got a new car. The employees are able to go ahead and they're getting married now and their their lives are improving because of the system, right? And when we when we were, I wouldn't say sold the system, but when we were told that these things would happen, you sit there at your office in, in Arizona, you look on the wall and you have this, this kind of cartoon thing that talks about like what life can be if you can change the mentality of how you're going to run your business. And to me, even though we have so many challenges, we dropped that prime cost from 70% the first year to almost, you know, we, we're, we're running sub 50 prime costs in the summertime. And that to me is actually as a business owner feels great because it shows that you're actually able to manage your business and it's it's something it's a sense of accomplishment as a business owner to say hey we're actually putting money on the bottom line and then being able to offer your managers health insurance offer your manage bonuses on performance offer your managers paid time off right and your employees thank you for that right and it makes you feel good as a business owner to say you're able to provide that for them well, well, what's crazy is you think about this, say we started at 70%, and the reason I, at 70% prime is you had volumes. So, yeah. so all of a sudden with those same volumes and create better volumes, dropping down to what's your prime cost now? Well, in the summertime, we were at sub 50. Sub 50 in the summertime, and you're giving all these other benefits. You're spending more money on labor, if you will, because you're more efficient, you're ordering properly, you're making more money, so isn't the team. That's, a, that's amazing, because a lot of times, if I'm a restaurant owner and I hear the 55% prime cost, I go, that's, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Well, the truth of the matter is, you can go under that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you decide, we could, they could have gone even lower, but you gave back. Mm -hmm. You decide as an ownership, we're going to give more. And I've spent a lot of time talking with you and your partner, David. Uh, they want to, they figure if they improve their employees' lives, their lives improve. And so there's culture to go along with it. You can implement systems. You can actually make more money, still take care of your guests, still take care of employees. It's not that you become greedy. You know, I think sometimes, sometimes people fear that if I go after this trying to make money, we're going to buy shitty product and we're going to cut labor so bad we're in bad service. We do none of those things, right? You, you still have the high quality product. You still have incredible service. You still offer all these benefits, right? Yeah. And is it, with the system, with the beauty of the system is, and I always compare it when I sit in the management and say, you know, this, we're like a, a boat floating in the ocean, right? And we're sitting, travel along this journey. And what's happening is the boat taking on water, right? Money's just going out. Expenses are going out. Money's just, just leaving leaving the boat. And you're, you're sinking. You're sinking. And what SSP does is it says, you know what? This is where the ship's leaking. This is where the ship's leaking. This is where it's leaking. And you start plugging those holes and you see it start to rise up. The bank accounts start to rise up. And you're like, you know what? Now I can solve these problems because I have the money. I have the cash flow. If you don't have the cash flow, you can't solve the problems. And so if you can't identify how that ship is kind of sinking, then you're kind of dead in the water. And so what SSP has done more than anything else, even though we have, and we have, we were looking over the numbers today, we have so many challenges that we're still trying to overcome, but we have a viable path forward and how to get there, right? And what I love about the group, 
um, and, and, and about your company is that the team, your team, your support staff, when you call and you, if you honestly want to sit there and you want to find out where these, these holes are leaking, they will provide you a viable path forward to do so. They'll say, okay, are you taking your inventories? Okay, you're not, okay, we'll take your inventories and then call us back. Okay, so now you're taking your inventory. Okay, so is your schedule variance right? Did you do your schedule? Oh, you haven't done, so go do that. And it's like literally a checklist of what you need to do in order to get your company uh, back on track and, and to make it better, right? Because there's a difference between trying to fix something that's broken and then actually making something that can be great. Right. And that's what I love about SSP is it gives you the option to fix something that's broken, but if you truly want to be great and you truly want to run a great company, they can give you the system, the checklist of all you have to follow to go ahead and make sure that it becomes a reality. And if you're a non-member, SSP stands for Smart Systems Pro. That's our online ma restaurant management solution. If there was one takeaway you want somebody, whether they're an existing member or a future member, you say, what is that piece of device to get success with this? What's that one takeaway you want them to have? You just got to have to have the drive to push it into your employees and the support staff uh, to, to buy into the system. And, and to me, the hardest part, the hardest part is convincing uh, yourself, it's hard convincing myself and my business partner to convince himself that we could get this back on track and that the system would work. And when we were told that it's gonna take time, uh, you know, it could take three months, six months, a year, it's gonna take time and it's gonna be painful. But if you believe that you can go ahead and make the change, they have all this, all the structure and systems in place to go ahead and make that change. So it really starts with the decision of saying, yes, we're gonna go ahead and implement it, you know? And it, it, I just wanna be clear. It's not an easy process, right? No. Uh, you're going to lose managers, yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, you're going to have to turn over and change, and it's not a it's not a six six months is aggressive. It takes yeah. six months to a year because you're really changing culture. The systems part's easy, no, but no. it's the people part, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're in a business of people, right? We're in a business of relationships, whether it's with vendors, with employees, with your customers, and so those relationships are completely different than actually what the system helps you manage is, right? Because you have to make sure that your customer service is great. You're gonna have to make sure that your, your, your vendor relationships are great. And those are things that are kind of outside the scope of the system. Within the company itself that you provide, there's other resources that you provide in SSP about handling customer service, right. how to deal with you know, employee training and all these different steps that handle the whole other side. But within the system itself, it's gonna help you dial in on where the problem is and give you a path to go ahead and fix it. Awesome. I want to thank you so much for taking time to share and uh, I'm sure we'll bring you back sometime soon. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Do you truly want to harness the power of Smart Systems Pro and everything we do here at therestaurantexpert.com to help you control your prime cost? Well, then there is one incredibly important report that you've got to use. It is the mother of all reports. It's called a budget variance report. Now, the key word there is it starts with the word budget. Without a budget, how the hell do you know where you should be? We don't use industry averages. You've heard me talk about that over and over and over again. Your restaurant is different. We understand prime costs is total cost goods sold plus total labor costs, including taxes, benefits, insurance. We understand that we should be shooting for a 55% prime cost or under if we do $850,000 a year more in sales, if we do less than that, 60. And we've got members that are in the low 40s on a weekly basis, higher volume, sell a lot of liquor, but all of a sudden 55 isn't even just the number, it's a starting point. Oh, by the way, that's without giving up guest satisfaction, without cutting product quality, without screwing the guest, if you will it's still staying true to your core values and who you are. So the budget variance is incredibly important. And what we've got to do is get you to working towards a weekly budget variance. That means we've got to take inventories on a weekly basis, track our labor on a weekly basis. We've got to have targets to shoot for that we hit those targets, that which we measure improves. So let's look at what we've got to do to have that budget variance work and then review it. So we're gonna go over here to Smart Systems Pro. I'm gonna to go to the dashboard and I'm gonna click on the four phase plan. A four phase plan is simply something that we put together to kind of give you a guide of where you start and what you've gotta get done. Well, notice here, I started off with priority number one of the four phase plan, phase one. 
And in it, things that I want you to pay attention to is we've got to make sure we're doing our daily paperwork. Manager log is not important for it, but we need to know our forecasted sales. How do we know how many people to bring in? How much food we can buy? We don't know without forecasted sales. We need our end of day reporting. What are our nightly numbers that we're tracking? If we have paid outs, making sure that those tomatoes you bought with money from the bar drawer actually makes it into your system and is a part of food cost. Invoice logs using manual price compare and or our smart scan service where you take a picture of your invoice, scan it with your, your phone, email it to us, and the next day it's a spreadsheet for you to simply upload in the system. I need that line by line entry into the software. Well, the purchase allotment system is important, but it has nothing to do with budget variance. It's going to have something to do with controlling your, your food cost, your poor cost, every time you place an order. But right now, I've got to have sales forecast, end of day, paid out log, invoice log. Those are musts. Next, you got to make sure all your products usable in Smart Systems Pro so that we can create batch recipe cards. Now, this is incredibly important. What is a batch recipe? A batch recipe is a soup, side dish, sauce, uh, any ingredient that you manufacture, desserts, anything you manufacture, make from scratch in your own restaurant, even if it's diced onions, right? Anytime you walk across, walk into your walk-in cooler and look at an item and say, oh, there's diced onions. What's the value of that? You need a batch recipe because it started with a you know bag of onions and what was left over. You threw away stuff, which means, right, yield. It means the value of whatever you just prepped is actually more, is worth more than you would think of what's left over because we threw away items. So make sure you get on the YouTube channel and look at what I talk about yield tests. And we'll probably do it as a, a future tip on here. So you got to have batch recipes. So when you walk around and take inventory, when I see a, a, a half gallon of soup, I know that it's 0.5 and there's a value to it. Next, shelf to sheet inventory. Now, if you watched last episode, I talked about shelf to sheet inventory in the order it appears on the shelf the way you want it counted. Maybe a 30 pound case of McCain's potato wedges in your walk-in freezer in the first position. You may then go into your, and you're going to count it that way. You're going to price it that way, value it, I should say. You could go into your reach-in freezer, and in the sixth position, you find McCain's potato wedges in five-pound bags, count 4.5 with the value. You may have your drawer freezer, open it up, and there's loose McCain's potato wedges valued by the ounce, and next to it, five-ounce portion bags of McCain's potato wedges, which is a batch recipe. See, you can't take an accurate inventory without batch recipes. Then we've got to have weekly inventories. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you watch my uh, tips on here, oh my gosh, it could take me four hours, David. There's no way I can get this done. Well, with Smart Systems Pro and Shelf the Sheet Inventory, we have $4 million, $6 million restaurants who take inventory in under an hour every week accurately. No longer do they have $30,000 in shredded cheese because somebody counted ounces and had a case price like your spreadsheet would. Really, really powerful and fast. So you know your food costs on a weekly basis. Then one last piece that I need on the labor systems, whether you're using the scheduling portion or not at this point, doesn't matter. You run one system called the labor allotment that is taking your labor summary report from your POS system from last week, typing the actual regular hours, regular pay, overtime hours, overtime pay, just typing them into the system and using your budget target from your budget it's going to tell you how many hours and dollars you have to spend next week to be on budget. But you know, we don't even need that. We just need that labor summary typed in because we want to know what your actual labor cost was for last week. See, your point of sale system is the gold standard for your payroll, right? You verify on a daily basis that it's accurate because that's what you use to phone in your payroll, to fax in your payroll, to enter in online. Doesn't matter. Those numbers are what you use. So if we agree that that is your gold standard, then that is your actual labor cost. So what I'm going to do is go back into Smart Systems Pro. I'm going to scroll down to Prime Cost tab, and then I'm going to click on Budget Variance. Now, in order, you can run a budget variance for any length of time, but I want to make sure I run it for a week. So I pick my two days based on inventories, and it quickly populates data. What do I see? I see my projected sales that came from my sales forecast, and I've got my actual sales that came from my end of day report. In this case, I know that I didn't reach my sales forecast by $191 in food sales. Overall, for the, for the week, I was only $230 off. 
They were lower, but I was off, but oh, 230. That's pretty damn good. You may find sometimes that we have weather events and things that are out of our control that actually make that quite different. And if your sales drop, it makes it much harder, much harder to make a profit in your business. Now, I come down here and I look at my target cost of goods sold. I had a target of 21.5%. That came from my budget. I input it in Smart Systems Pro and it drives all of my systems. So I needed to use 21 and a half cents, if you will, on every dollar that comes in in food sales in food product. Well, based on inventories, beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending gives me use. My use was actually $10,936. Use divided by sales, 10,000 divided into $49,000 in sales, says I actually ran a 22.28% food cost. My budget was 21%, 21.5. Now here's something you gotta pay attention to. I'm not gonna multiply 21.5 times my forecasted sales of 49,273. I did less in sales. So the system automatically comes across and takes your target budget, multiplies it by your actual sales and says, I should have used, based on the sales that actually walked in my doors, $10,552. Well, that means I've wasted, misused $384 in food for just that week. Now that's important. You know, later we can look at waste sheets and see how far we're off. Doesn't matter if that's in there. Uh, bottom line, as you can see, I only have $3 in waste. We weren't using the waste sheet that week. And that's important because the waste sheet is a proactive management tool, which allows you to make a decision to not make the same dumbass mistakes day, day after day. If I'm throwing away tomatoes twice a week because I buy too many of them, reduce your par. If I find that uh, Jose is burning steaks, retrain Jose, right? You can make changes proactively to make sure that variance is smaller and smaller. Now it'll never be perfect. But the fact of the matter is, the closer to perfect I can get, the better. Now, I look at each one of these things and I see that I'm off each one of my categories, but ultimately I'm $445 off in what? In cost of goods sold. Now, as I scroll down, the same principle happens for labor cost. So this 12.8% is not times what my forecasted sales are, it's my actual sales. And so if we look at this, I forecasted a 12.8%. Uh, 18% and I actually did a accomplished use based on the labor summary report, the gold standard for my payroll came from my POS system. We actually spent $7,600 or a 12.61% labor cost for line cooks. I'm $260 over budget, $34 over budget, under, under, over, over. Ultimately, I'm $332 over budget. That's in labor. Now it's just a week. If you look at this, okay, I'm only $450 off uh, on cost of goods sold. I'm only $330 off on labor. That's not a lot of money, is it? Well, wait, I'm gonna come down here. Now you'll notice I see my management salaries as a variance of zero. That comes from Smart Systems Pro. Do know owners and site administrators, whatever your site administrators are, they're the only ones that can see that, meaning what the salaries are. Uh, unless you've given permission to a uh, manager to see so. So they may not see that. But we've got our hourly managers, we've got front of house, back house, kind of summarizes everything uh, by department. But then you'll notice I've got taxes, benefits, insurance. When we set you up, we ask what your target or your what you are running for taxes, benefits, insurance as a percentage of payroll. So we type that in and it, and it calculates it on its own. It's not going to be perfect right? It's just so we can have a prime cost control. So it estimated we should use, based on actual sales, 2,338. Uh, bottom line is here, we are $49 off. We total everything up. And for the week, we're $828 off just for a week. Now, why is this important to know? Because there's 52 weeks in a year. That's $43,000 over budget. If you continue doing this practice of just being a few hundred dollars off in costs get sold, just a few hundred dollars off in labor and think it's no big deal, it's $43,000. Better yet, if this was week one, week two of the week, right, for the month, if you will, I now have the opportunity to make small changes over the next couple weeks, two, three weeks without giving up guest satisfaction, without cutting product quality, without going against my core values to find that money. 
See, as a manager, you should never miss your bonus because every week you're measuring. And the only way to measure is you've got to follow the phase one. Give me daily paperwork, give me weekly inventories, and a single typed in report called a labor summary. And you have the power of profitability at your fingertips. The ability to make changes in your business instead of being a reactive management team, a proactive management team. Look, if you want to get the most out of Smart Systems Pro, call your restaurant coach today and make sure you're set up in phase one. I'm here with Brittany Ty, one of our restaurant coaches here at therestaurantexpert.com. Thanks for being with me today. You're welcome. Uh, do us a favor, tell everybody a little bit about your background. Hi everyone, my name is Brittany Ty and I'm a software coach and training specialist for therestaurantexpert.com. I've been here for four years now and within that time I've worked in full service and quick service restaurants for the line to management role. And you've been here as a coach, not only a uh, coach, but you're our software trainer. Yeah. You work directly with uh, our my business partner, Chef Fred Langley, on consulting. So you work with Gino and, and him on making sure all the consulting clients are done. Basically, uh, she handles just about everything here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you talk with not only our, our consulting clients but uh, and their managers, but our members, uh, those that have been signed to you. Talk about what are some of the biggest challenges you find they bring to you on a daily basis? One of the biggest challenges I find is probably just owners holding their management team accountable. Um, I find that, you know, they'll complain about how, let's say for example, reverse labor takes a long time, but reverse labor, if you do it, that's going to cut, cut off time in your payroll expenses, which is going to help lower your, your actual prime cost. And people don't realize that extra 15 minutes a day will help you save thousands of dollars. So what you find is, is if I'm hearing you properly, is you're going to assign things to a manager to do. Mm -hmm. They're going to learn the new system and they're going to tell you it's too hard. Yep. It takes too long, right? Kind of same thing. Exactly. So one of the things that we talk about when we, when we teach it is, is when you learn something new, yeah, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. But as you get going, I mean, it gets faster, faster, faster. So talk about some of the systems that you find that the, the initial pushback, like it's too hard, it takes too much time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's definitely going to be reverse labor, a labor allotment. Some people don't realize their labor allotment feeds into the budget variance report, which is their weekly report um, that they, they can see their prime cost in. And that's going to take five minutes a day or five minutes every Monday, yep. but people just won't take the time to do it. Definitely getting their, their daily paperwork done. Let's say, for example, um, one of their things is invoice log. Well, if you don't enter the invoice log daily or whenever you do receive an order, you're not going to be able to see your purchase allotment systems, and that's going to cut a couple points off of your prime cost just using the purchase, purchase allotment system alone. But other than that, it's definitely going to be weekly inventory, another thing that feeds in your prime cost. So basically, my main point is things that feed into your budget variance report you have to do. It's imperative. You have to make sure you're getting those done as soon as possible. That way you can pull a weekly weekly report and not wait for your accountant to give you that report. So let's break it down. So if we say we want a budget variance report, and that is critical. I mean, that is something we talk about internally here is, is to get you the best results, that which we measure improves. So we start with a budget and we get that done. Now we have these targets and you want to use Smart Systems Pro to control it. Well, daily paperwork is end of day numbers. Well, let's start off with sales forecast. Do that once a month. Yeah. How long does it take to do sales forecast now with the automatic system in? It takes me about three minutes. Three minutes. You're going to choose a couple dates, done, make some adjustments. We've got our end of day report, yeah. our nightly numbers. How long does it take to type in your, your daily sales report? Five minutes max. And you've done it because yeah. you've worked for, with, with restaurants using our system and literally type it in yourself. Yeah. Five minutes. Boy, that sounds like a lot of work. Invoices. Invoices can be, if the larger restaurant, we've got multiple vendors, uh, if I'm using Smart Scan or manual price compare and I'm actually uh, doing orders in SSP and the invoice comes in, how long does it take to update your invoices, make sure those are accurate? It takes me about 10 minutes to do 10 of those. So matter of just if you've ordered in the system, you take that you find this spreadsheet that's either we've emailed to the member or they get from their vendor and they zip it up. Yeah. 10 invoices in 10 minutes. Yep, I can do it in one minute. And mind you, I do work here, so I understand I'm a little bit faster, but you will get to the point where you can do that yourself. 
Okay, so now we've got inventories. Assuming we've put all the work in to do shelf to sheet inventory, I've got to take inventory. Uh, how long does it take a typical member that you've got actually doing shelf to sheet inventory? How long does that take? Um, I'd say an hour max, just depending on how big their restaurant is and how big their you know walk-in storage, dry storage, all of that. So if we, we take this three, four hour process, make it an hour, but you've got to do it. So now next we have a labor allotment. And labor allotment is typing in a labor summary report from your point of sale system. That, without using any of the labor systems, that feeds into your budget variance. How long does that take? It's three minutes. Three minutes. So basically, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, 15 minutes work on a daily basis for invoices and end of day report, mm -hmm. uh, sales forecast once a month, which takes three minutes. If I'm putting my invoices in, well, that's part of that. So really what you're telling me is that when a manager tells an owner that there's this is way too hard, this takes way too much time. Is it that they don't know how to do it and are afraid to ask for help? Is it that they don't like the accountability, they don't want the extra work? Um, what is it you find is the major reason why you're getting the pushback? See, I find that it is one of those things where they don't wanna take that accountability and take that extra time, but that just shows me that that manager doesn't care. And at the end of the day, if you really care about that restaurant, you do wanna help them save money no matter what it takes. So bottom line is, is, is when you have a coaching call, whether it's for a consulting client, and, and she works directly with, with our, on our consulting side of things, so you are literally managing managers on a daily basis, mm -hmm. making sure all this work is done, helping them make sure it gets there. But it's no different for them than it is for our members. The only yeah. difference is we do a little more heavy lifting, right? Yeah, exactly. So, what is it that you tell people, like when they first start off, and whether they're a consulting client, whether they're a member, um, this is gonna take a little bit of time to learn. How, how long does it take to become proficient at these things that we rattle off three minutes here, five minutes there, 10 minutes there? Mm -hmm. What do you find that, that it takes an average person to learn? An average person to learn the entire system, I'd say six months to a year, definitely. It does take us some time, but to, to be able to do the daily paperwork and um, everything like that, the daily paperwork, labor systems, food and beverage systems, I'd say it takes three months for them to fully understand that part. So if we started and we, we said we start with the daily paperwork, mm -hmm. um, within four weeks they'd have that down? Yeah, typically I get that down in about three weeks. Okay, and we start the labor system. If we're just talking about labor summary report, mm -hmm. how long does that take? Two well, weeks? I'd, yep, I'd say two weeks. Okay, meaning you've done it twice but because it's a weekly item. Mm -hmm. To set up, once we've set up shelf to sheet inventory, so we've got to back away setting it up because mm -hmm. we're going to help with that. Uh, once they start taking it, we know that internally it takes three, four inventories before you get it right, yeah. right? Um, how long does it take them to get that down that it's about an hour? What do you mean? I mean, they start counting. Once we've got it set up properly oh, okay. to actually get the counts done, how long does it take them to learn to count it in the order they see it on the shelves and then put it into SSP? Well, I've actually physically gone in a restaurant that I didn't even work at and did their shelf to sheet for them. And it took me two different, two different inventories to fully know their products and pack sizes, even though I'm not in their restaurant. So, so bottom line is, as an owner, should they be accepting that this is too hard? Nope, absolutely Sh not. Are, are you easy to get a hold of? Like yeah. if they hit the chat function, they could get you, right? Yep. If they call, they could get you, right? Yep. If they email, they could get you, right? Yep. So why, is, why don't they want to do it? At the end of the day, I feel like there's no excuses when you have all of the training and technical support that you need. I physically have had someone's screen up on my screen and they've called about, I'd say 20 times that day just to make sure they're doing their, their work the correct way. And so we'll do that. Bottom line is, if you were to uh, leave those people listening or watching us right now, uh, one piece of advice, what would that be when it comes to implementing? Probably, my number one advice is just to make sure you're holding your management team accountable. If you're not backing us up, then there's no point. And at the end of the day, you have to remember you're saving thousands by just that 15 minutes a day at the end of the day. Well, there you hear it, somebody who's done it, works with your people, works with our consulting clients, you gotta hold people accountable. You gotta make sure this is getting done and run your restaurant your way so you can start making the money you deserve. Thank you, Brittany. You're welcome, have a great day, everyone. I'm here 
in Las Vegas, Nevada at the corporate offices of Repeat Returns with a good friend of mine, Cameron Carrington. He is the marketing expert. There's nobody else out there that you should be listening to. I've known him for 14 years and he is top notch. And uh, Cameron, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. My pleasure to be here, buddy. Fantastic. Uh, do me a favor, I know your story, but share with people a little bit about your background and just a tad about your company. Okay, let's start with how I got in the restaurant business. I was making a phone call to get tickets to the Rolling Stones. The guy had lousy tickets, I told him I was gonna pass, and then he said the weirdest thing. He said, you wouldn't wanna buy my pizzeria, would you?" What? No. And uh, I owned a pizzeria three days later. So, long story short, we were doing $12,000 a month when I bought it, three years later we were doing $1.6 million a year. I uh, learned a lot along the way, and when I got out of the business, I kind of made it a mission of mine to share what I'd learned, and one thing led to another. And what we really found is that most restaurant owners don't have the time to consistently get their marketing done, so we created a company that could do it for them, and using the latest, um, you know, data analytics, uh, you know, to to. For, for an independent restaurant to have the programmers and all the staff on tap to do everything that's coming down the pike with all the, you know, the data, the social, the mobile apps, all that stuff, it's impossible. So we take care of that. We provide it at what I think is a pretty affordable price, ridiculously affordable compared to what, you know, marketing used to cost. And we do their marketing for them. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you talk about whether you have the money to do so. Even if you had the money, if you don't have the know-how, it doesn't matter. And you're the man who has the know-how. Um, I wanted to share a little bit, maybe some of the challenges you find restaurants are facing today when it comes to marketing. The challenges they're finding is there's been a big shift in demographics out there. Most restaurant marketing is frozen in time. It is keeping restaurant owners afloat, but smarter marketing, you know, is life altering. So. The challenge they face is what to do, when to do it, what should they try, what should they ditch. And there's, there's just a shift now to where it's all data driven. You know, you look at Amazon, you look at Google, Facebook, data drives the decisions. It makes no mistakes, yeah, very few. An example of that would be, you look at Google's deep mind. There's a, a game called Go. I don't even know what this game's about, but it's supposedly the most complicated board game in the world. And, and Google's deep mind with self-learning beat the world go expert and at the same time it revealed a way to play the game and to win the game that the human mind had never even considered. So that's what data and analytics can do for you uh, when you put them together and you, you let it run. So basically if I were to put it in layman's terms for, for a lot of people it's uh, instead of using your gut and throwing money and mud at the wall to hopefully figure out what, what works, um, you're literally using their data, their customers, customer habits, uh, how they're spending patterns, uh, demographics, all the different things that you can find out on that social media unit, and you are able to take whatever dollar they spend and, it, and make it this tiny and get these kinds of results. I mean, is that what we're talking about? We're talking about creating a separate marketing path for each customer based on their habits and their uh, spending patterns, and then trying to improve the results from that. And the difference between that and this batch and blast type of marketing, what I call, you know, it's like a headless chicken running around, is, is, is they keep throwing stuff at, at their marketing, trying to get people in the front door. The easiest thing to do is let customers reveal to you when they like to come in, how much they like to spend, when they like to open their emails, and then just start adapting to each customer so that it's more of a personalized experience that they've become used to with the Amazons, Googles, and Facebooks. I remember talking to you years ago as you were starting to put those analytics together and you've perfected them now is, is uh, a part of it is you don't have a one way to market to everybody. One person may come in just because you said hi. One person comes in for a 10% discount. Somebody comes in for whatever offer because you know their habits. You know what it takes to poke them. So you don't have to say, uh, let's take the, the, old, the old way of doing things. I'm going to put a BOGO out, a buy one, get one free. And you send it out to all your customers. Well, 90% of them might have showed up if you just said hi. Your own customers are the biggest users of discounts. Most marketing over discounts your biggest spenders. 
uh, as you know from the operations side, you're, you're trying to save people pennies here and there. With marketing, they're literally surrendering uh, huge piles of profit that they, they could have by default because they are over discounting in an attempt to drive new people through the front door. What we say is, let's do what you need to to get somebody new through the front door, but from that point forward, let's adapt and allow the customer to spend more. Don't, don't train them to spend, to spend less. Don't train them to wait for deals. Amen. Adjust to their, you know, their preferences. That's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really uh, groundbreaking, it's at least for the independent operator. Chains have had access to some of these things for many, many years. And, um, you know, the positive is with what you do, you can handle the chain operator, you can handle the individual operator. But it's not for everybody, right? This is not a panacea. Like if, if, you're, if your restaurant is about to die, you don't call yeah. Cameron up and go, help me, help me, help me. <laughs> if you're about to die, you may have already made too many mistakes when it comes to marketing. It's not for everybody. Who is that ideal person that says, you're right for what we do? Uh, for what we do, it's, it's, it's really the, uh, the franchises, the multis, the medium to high volumes, the, because they've already got something going that is working for them. And the thing with good marketing is it makes a good business better and it, it makes a bad business go, go bankrupt quicker. So we don't want to offer false hope to people. If somebody calls up and says, hey, can you save my butt in the next 30 days? No. Smart marketing needs about 90 days to start to get to know the customer habits. And from that point forward, the gains you know, start coming on. But uh, yeah, if you're coming in and you're floating your payroll on credit cards and you got your home mortgage you know, paying the rent the last three months, you, you need to just get out of business. Uh, marketing is not going to save you. Well, uh, that's the old, you better have a good restaurant first. Uh, exactly. All the marketing in the world, if you're a bad restaurant, you can mark yourself to death, uh, literally out of business. Um, you and I had dinner the other night, and, and we talked a little bit about a love-hate relationship we all have with Yelp. Yep. Uh, and so I bet everybody's ears just sparked up going, oh, Yelp, love-hate. As, as somebody who travels all the time, I love Yelp because when I go to a, a city I don't know, where do I go to? I go to Yelp. Mm -hmm. What do I look for? Four and a half, five-star reviews, yep. four reviews, and, and that's where I go. And I don't go very far. As far as, as far as scrolling goes, I, f I know what I'm looking for and I find it. Um, but as an operator, sometimes we, uh, you and I had this conversation, we often uh, poo-poo Yelp and go, oh, those sons of bitches, they're like the mob. If I don't advertise, my good reviews disappear. Uh, that's not my customer. I'm a fine dining restaurant. That's somebody to go to a, to a taco shop. And, and we, we belittle it. And I always say, look, while we have this love-hate relationship, I've got members who have five-star, four-and-a-half-star reviews and they crush it. Uh, I have people who realize that, um, you know what, it could be that one employee because we're so, so worried about firing that one employee. It's the one you keep that is destroying your business one review at a time. Yeah. But you've got this neat spin on Yelp and, and share with people your view on Yelp because, again, I have a love-hate relationship with it. Sure. Somebody calls your baby ugly, what happens? Them is fighting words, right? So when somebody uh, badmouths your restaurant, <clears throat> you know, the first inclination is to strike back. And you need to respond to every review, good or bad, but when you can take the uh, animosity out of it and respond level-headedly, uh, then you're providing an environment where if, if somebody goes to a Yelp page and it's all five-star reviews, they don't believe it. They're looking for that one-star review and they're looking for how did you handle it? And if you just, you know, struck back at the person, that's a strike against you now. So what you need to do is be very level-headed about how you respond to your reviews. You need to address problems because like we said the other night, where there's smoke, there's probably fire. So if you're getting a lot of bad reviews, you've, you've got to figure out why. But uh, the love help, the love hate with Yelp is keeping more independent restaurants from attracting new traffic than I would say anything else today. Because like you said, when you're looking for something new, you got money in hand, you're looking for that, and you're ready to spend. If your Yelp profile is not maximized, and that's one of the things that we do here is that we do help uh, folks with their Yelp pages and manage the reviews and even crisis management when something really goes wrong. I can share some of that with you. But um, once you've done that, look at Yelp as SEO for your restaurant. So. You're going to get on the front page of Google when somebody searches pizza in uh, Las Vegas? 
It's going to be tricky. But with Yelp, how you handle your reviews, how you handle your page, and we're talking about from the photographs that you upload to some of the features that you put on there, this lifts your rankings up so that when somebody is searching Pizza Las Vegas, you have the opportunity to be right there. And again, nobody's searching for Yelp because they're your customer. They're searching for Yelp because they're looking for somewhere to go right now and uh, have dinner. Yeah, and that, that's probably the, the thing that we lose sight of as operators is when you look at Yelp um, and you advertise, it literally is the person who's looking for something specific right now. Because if they knew you and wanted to yeah. go to you, they'd go to you. Right. So it, it, it is, it's, the, it's the yellow pages back in the 1980s on steroids. Right? I mean, because it the bottom is. line is I'm looking for something and there it is right in my phone. Listen, the yellow pages, my ad was $1,500 a month. It was about this big. And I was about, I don't know, three or four pages back from Domino's and everybody else because you got where you could pay to get. Right. With Yelp, you can smoke the big chains. Why? Because most of them have shit ratings. Most of the chains do not care, or I mean, I'm sure they care, but the, with all the franchisees and everything, they're usually two, two and a half stars. So if you, you know, look at Yelp as a way that you can actually outperform and outcompete the bigger players by making sure that your page is taken care of. And that's one thing I'll tell you for sure is, you know, we can let folks know later is we do a free Yelp for you, review for any restaurant. We'll go over their page with them and, and, and cover what can help them. But um, most owners are blowing this opportunity right now. This is, this is like stealth. You, you come in, Embrace it, deal with it, and you make Yelp your bitch. <laughs> I love it. So uh, share with us a little bit of story you and I talked about the other day. Um, you can have one person walk in your restaurant and start literally a campaign with friends if they wanted to and drop you. You had a, a customer literally got the reviews down to one, one and a half stars. Yeah. And, and talk about that um, and, and how you turned it around, because this is magic. I mean, I've never heard anything like this before of what Cameron and his team can do. Okay, um, yeah, we'll go with the magic, I like that. Uh, here's what happened. Uh, a mom and pop pizzeria, and I mean, these are good people, right? They've got this pizzeria, got a little bar in it. Uh, some college kids come in one night, the bartender cards this one kid, he's Hispanic. His friends go crazy and start trashing this place that it's racist. So by morning, there was 27 one-star reviews. Most of them were from college students, you know, that even admitted, oh, I've heard about this place before, but now that I've heard it's racist, I'm never going there. So all these crazy reviews, but they just mobilized this mob mentality. And in the morning, it's full crisis mode. So... What we did is we contacted, you know, we let the owner know for sure. And they literally fell down to a one and a half star review, like disappeared on Yelp for all intents and purposes, right? It, yeah, they, they just tanked. And, and so we went to Yelp, we just worked with their legal team and, and uh, we got the page taken down because it was under attack. You know, once Yelp realized, and, you know, we could convince Yelp that it was under attack, we got the page taken down. Then Yelp has their algorithm that starts to look at all these reviews and realizes that they can see what's going on here. And these are not authentic customer reviews. So we were able to deal with that, get the page restored to where it was, and back to the authentic reviews that were there that uh, were related to an actual experience with the restaurant. And while we're there, let's talk about, um, you know, Warren Buffett once said that you know, he had an issue with one of his businesses that uh, a reputation can take decades to build and you can lose it in moments. And uh, so we tend to look at this uh, Yelp help service that we provide as reputation insurance as well, because not only can we help you rise up and pull more traffic in from your Yelp page, but when stuff goes wrong, do you know how to deal with it? Do you know how to, who to call it Yelp? We, we were on that within minutes in the morning. And uh, as far as the income opportunity, and this is probably what most folks want to know about, uh, three-store sushi restaurant in the Bay Area. We started them on Yelp Help, turned their page around, uh, started managing it for them. And over the next uh, 10 months, you know, we did a 10-month study on them. And in 10 months, we pulled in 183 new guests for them. That turned into 1,496 total visits. The average ticket was over 30 bucks. $248 uh, value per guest with total revenue of $45,534. So 
this is three sushi places getting a grip on their Yelp page, and this is real money. This is forty-five thousand dollars in three or in uh, ten months uh, from getting a handle on that. So, uh, I would encourage everybody out there to go to your Yelp page right now. See how you stack up. You can you you you're shooting yourself in the foot if you try to ignore this and pretend it's not there. Well. So that's the one piece. That was the kind of gun nugget. We know you and I talked like Yelp. Everybody wants to know about Yelp. But here's the deal. You have a full suite of marketing uh, in the sense that it's one thing to fix your Yelp. It's one thing to bring in a brand new customer. But everything I've learned is if you can get them back, come back more often, spend more, you'll actually grow your business even faster. Because the most expensive form of marketing tends to be new customer acquisition. Mm -hmm. Well, with the Yelp and things like that, you can actually take your new customer acquisition if you do it right and bring it down to pennies, but then explode your profits so you can pull them into a loyalty program. Talk about some of the suite, the, the, the suite of uh, different services and okay. software you provide. We'll, we'll cover that and let's, let's talk about how we merge that. So with Yelp, it brings a customer in. Five out of seven new visitors will not return without, without some kind of follow-up. They have a habit. You rarely take on a new restaurant without ditching another one. So habits are a little strong and people can easily fall out of it. They had dinner, they loved it, and but you know, I go to this other place and they fall back in the old habits. So if you can capture your customer's information and a great way to do that is the loyalty program, uh, it's a good exchange. I'll give you points and rewards for coming here more often and uh, you give me a way to contact you so I can let you know when you've earned a reward. So now that we've done that, we can do the follow-up. Now, what most people will do is say, hey, welcome to our loyalty program. Well, we do that too, but we can also put that new customer on what we call a new customer conversion path because we need to break an old habit somewhere and get them back. So we're looking now to educate this new guest about why the restaurant's different, why they're better, what they do differently. Is it farm fresh? Is it organic? What you know, we want to make the case for it. We don't want to just keep pounding discounts out. We want to give them reasons to come back and spend money and let the loyalty and rewards take care of the incentive. You reward them after they've spent a certain amount of money with you uh, for doing so instead of bribing them in for every visit. So once you've got this information now, now we do what I call the Bob and Sally routine, which is where uh, Bob comes in and orders typically on Friday, Sally comes in on Tuesday or Wednesday. So if an owner puts out an email blast, let's say Thursday or Friday, he might get Bob. He missed Sally. And so it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So we want marketing, as I alluded to in the beginning, that starts to learn each customer's behavior and when they spend, when they open their email so that we can get in front of them at a relevant time to maintain that top of mind at the right time. Uh, this is really the difference between your top 10 restaurants, you know, the top 10% and everybody else is making this shift to the smarter marketing that uh, engages rather than just pounds, pounds, pounds. Another thing with the uh, pounding the email blasts out, you get list fatigue. People keep going to that, uh, you know, keep ringing that bell because when they do, they do get traffic. But they're also getting a lot of opt-out. People are getting sick of hearing from them all the time. So when you get in step, you get less opt-out, you get uh, more traffic, you get better spend because you're not over discounting everybody. And part of that is, uh, you know, our retention program. In pizza, it's 60, uh, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, typically a good retention program. If I haven't seen a customer in a month, well, geez, they must be gone. Uh, thing is, when you look at each individual customer, if you've got a customer that comes in every day and they're gone for a month, they're gone, dude. And, yeah, but, you, yeah. you know, the 30, 60, 90 waited a month to send something out. We're looking at each customer, and we are basing retention on the customer's frequency, not the calendar. So yeah. by doing that, we're able to increase frequency better. We recapture, on average, over $32,000 a year for each restaurant. And that's the average. I mean, some are well over 100000 you know, the real high-volume places. But by getting smart retention in place, that's the key to growth. Attracting new customers is great. But at five years, since most restaurants are bleeding about 18% of their customer base every year, you get to five years and now all of a sudden, all the marketing in the world is only bringing in as many customers as you're losing. And so if you can, you can trim this side off and keep customers, you keep bringing in new ones, yeah. uh, turning them into good steady regulars, 
then your growth can pick up again. So do me a favor. We could talk forever. Uh, you and I could do this, and we only have a certain amount of time. Um, tell people a little bit about how they contact you, what your company does. Okay. We take care of digital marketing, and um, I could get into all the details of it, but let me just, let, let, let's talk about the benefits. We're going to help you attract new customers. We're going to help you convert them to steady regulars. We're going to help you increase their frequency and their spend, and we're going to help you retain them much longer. And, uh, you know, a lot of your members are using our services, so you hear these things that you're... you're uh, Oh, no we've advance. got we've got we've got people have great success. We've got people who do nothing. Uh, it's like anything. It's even with our software, our services. If you don't take action, it's not magic. Mm -hmm. However, there's more magic to what you do because you can automate where I have to make you do things. I also can tell you that we not only. Um, love what you guys do, but we, they're part of our loyalty program for our members. So whether you're one of our members now, you make sure you talk to Greg Sauerbach and he'll put you in contact. We've got a special deal with uh, repeat returns for those people who are starting uh, with them. If you are watching us and you're not a member, um, how do they contact you? I want to make sure that, that, that uh, you know, mm -hmm. they can reach out. Okay. Well, there we go. Go to repeatreturns.com. And that'll give you everything you need. Our phone number is 702-966-3001. And what I wanted to finish here with is, uh, in the beginning, I told you that there's been a big uh, shift in demographics. And that's um, one of the things owners need to be aware of. And the surprising thing is, there was a restaurant chain, a pizza chain actually, that has outperformed every publicly traded restaurant on Wall Street. They've outperformed Facebook, Google, Amazon, Netflix, you name it, and it's Domino's Pizza. And as Domino's Pizza was rising up and going from, gosh, what was it, like 900 million maybe in market, uh, or in uh, stock market, you know, market cap, to over 8 billion <laughs> during this five to six year period. During that time, independent pizzerias in this country went from 52% market share to 39% market share. And the reason being, Domino's reinvented themselves as a tech digital IT company. It's, it's all about the data. Uh, mom and pops keep pounding the emails and they're just missing the boat. So there's the, you know, all the proof you need is Domino's went to uh, digital IT data and they, they've outperformed the biggest tech companies on the planet during that period. So there you go. You want to take your marketing to the next level. You've got to use the same tools that the dominoes of the world use. And uh, whether you're a, a chain operator watching us or you're an independent, again, somebody who's looking to take their business to the next level, not that you're about to die, not the time to call Cameron and his team, but you're ready to take your business to the next level, uh, I highly recommend repeat returns. Again, we recommend it to all our members. And in fact, make sure you talk to Greg Sauerbeck on our teams if you're watching, you're one of our people. Cameron, I want to thank you for taking the time with us today. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this month's episode of the Smart Systems Insider version 2.0, a video magazine created for you, the independent operator, to make more money, get your life back, have managers know their job. Now, there are some really great takeaways in this month's episode. I talked about your responsibility to run profitably and the importance of a budget, followed by a software tip called the Budget Variance Report in Smart Systems Pro, but more importantly, how our restaurant coach, Brittany Ty, shared with you the step-by-step -step process of putting that in place and why it's so damn important. Now, I was thrilled to have an interview with one of our elite members, Jason Motika, how he talked about he and his partner, David McCarthy's journey from one restaurant to five, but more importantly, the importance of running your business by the numbers. And then I can't tell you how thrilled I was to have a good friend of mine, Cameron Carrington, the CEO of Repeat Returns, a restaurant loyalty program, but he is the authority when it comes to restaurant marketing. And he shared with you the ins and outs of Yelp, why it's so important, why you've got to pay attention to it and how to maximize your, really the effects of using it. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on this month's episode. Do me a favor, make sure you subscribe now so we can alert you when next month's episode goes live.